According to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, stroke is a leading cause of death in the United States, and it's a major cause of serious disability. The good news is that stroke is both preventable and treatable. On this week's Health Talk, our guest is Michelle Licardo. She's the Stroke Program Coordinator at Norwell Hospital. Michelle will provide important tips on how you can help prevent a stroke, both for yourself and for a loved one. Hello, I'm Dr. Eric Mazur. Today's Health Talk topic is stroke prevention. Our guest is Michelle Licardo. She's Stroke Program Coordinator at Norwalk Hospital. Michelle, welcome back to the show. Hi, thank you for having me. This is such an important topic. Stroke is not an obscure disease. See an awful lot of it. We've heard a lot in this COVID era about stroke. Yep. As we both sit here in our masks. I know. <laughs> so, uh, so tell us, you know, we talk about stroke being preventable. And this is something... Uh, it really is, if you start at the right time in your life. Tell us, exactly. what are the preventable things that you see out there that people are not doing or should be thinking more about? Well, as we continue to learn more and more about stroke and the progression of the disease itself, we start to find that there's a lot of correlations to other disease processes. We all know the typical preventative for stroke. We know low cholesterol, we know monitor your blood pressure, we know if you have AFib, but there's other things now that we're bringing into it that if you have a history of carotid disease, if you have a history of any type of arterial disease, those have been things that we now correlate with stroke, diabetics with stroke. So looking at your other diseases, mm -hmm. looking at those, proce the, those processes and seeing, is there something that I need to be worried about? Does it put me at a higher risk for having a stroke if I have diabetes? Does it put me at a higher risk for having stroke if I have peripheral artery disease? We're hearing more and more about people with arterial disease and we're seeing more strokes in that and population. And it's really not a surprise. Nope. Because, uh, and maybe we need to describe for folks, what is a stroke? Yes. Yeah, so tell us, you know, so, we, everybody hears the term, but <laughs> a lot of people may not really know what we're talking about. What is a stroke? So stroke falls into two categories. The most common for stroke is what we call ischemic. It means that there's a blood clot in that cerebral artery that now has prevented blood from flowing. No different than backing up your toilet or backing up your sink. There's a clot hanging out in that pipe and blood flow can't get through. That's about 80% of our population. And your brain needs a constant flow of blood mm -hmm. to stay alive. It actually uses a lot of the, the output of your heart yes. to bring energy and oxygen to the brain. Uh, and it doesn't do very well without no, oxygen <laughs> or sugar for very long, does it? No. So, and that's the other important piece is, you know, there could be very, very subtle signs of stroke um, that people might not think that I'm actually having a stroke. So we really want people to be, if anything, overreact to your signs and symptoms. There are some that are very large and you know that they're having a stroke, but you could have some dizziness. You could have some balance issues that somebody's like, oh, maybe that's not. You need to get that checked out. Mm -hmm. There are things that we can now do that we couldn't do in the past. Yeah, this is an area where in my career, I've seen a total revolution in our approach mm -hmm. to stroke. Uh, in the past, again, you get a clogged artery. It was unfortunate, but it, you, you let it go and there wasn't anything you nope. did to try to reverse that. Uh, now we and this we're talking about thrombotic strokes uh, or ischemic strokes as you do. Um, and uh, but now we know there are things that we can do to treat them, which we're going to talk about another time. Yes. But but in terms of preventing preventing strokes, uh, so tell us a little bit more about you know so diabetes the, or high blood pressure. So a little bit is is knowing your own personal risk factors. So you as an individual, what risk factors do you have? Which ones can we change and which ones can't we change? So we cannot change your gender. We know that more females have stroke more than men. We also cannot change your race or ethnicity. We know that it's more for the black, the Asians, Hispanics have strokes more than whites. But we can change hypertension. You can High control blood your blood pressure. So if you're someone who's never had their blood pressure checked and you're at a clinic or walking through a fair and they're doing blood pressure checks, a lot of people have no idea that they have high blood pressure because they feel fine. So the term for high blood pressure also changed. Anybody who has a blood pressure greater than 120, if 
for the top number and greater than 80 for the bottom number is considered to have high blood pressure, which is totally different over the last 15 to 20 years than mm -hmm. what we ever had before. We've become more conservative. Those yes. numbers have been gone down lower. Yes. And again, I think one reading may or may not, you know, don't, if you nope. go to a fair <laughs> and you're up and you've just walked or you've just had an exciting ride on a, on a roller coaster, uh, that reading may not be right, but it certainly means you should be checked. Yes, and it means that you should follow up with a physician right. to get that monitor. If you know that you have a family history of strokes, if you know that you have a family history of high cholesterol, those are things that as we continue to age, so for myself in my 50s, I never thought of myself as being sick. Um, but now that I'm starting to reach a higher age, those are things that I need to look for for my own personal risk. And factors. blood pressure tends to go up as you get older, too. Yes, so it does. just because you had a normal blood pressure at 20 doesn't mean you're not at risk at 50. No. Nope. Uh, and yeah. the other thing that I have seen, and I hope we're seeing less of it, patient goes in, they, they see their doctor, they have high blood pressure, they're put on a pill, their blood pressure normalizes, and they say, oh, I don't have high blood pressure anymore. And they go off their medicine. Yeah, so it's truly that routine maintenance. No different than when we take our cars for routine maintenance, we need to take our bodies for routine maintenance and truly following up with physicians. Don't just take yourself off your medications. Don't just stop taking your diabetes medications because you feel that your blood sugars have been normal. Those are all things that put you at a higher risk for stroke that you need frequent maintenance on and you follow up with your physicians. And, uh, and you, you made the point, I just want to make it explicitly, uh, Anything that gives you vascular disease can give you a stroke. So that's mm -hmm. high blood pressure, cholesterol, lack of exercise, smoking. I presume smoking is related. Person, uh, yeah. Be because Obesity. the brain is just one organ that's fed by your mm -hmm. arterial system. And if you get that arterial system is atherosclerotic uh, or gets clogged with, cl with clot, you're, you're going to get a stroke. Yeah. Inactivity, you know, um, lack of physical activity. One thing that we also know is that lack of exercise also increases our risk for stroke, which that is a modifiable risk factor. So those are all things that you can change. Your diet you can change to maintain your cholesterol. Those are all modifiable risk factors. And the big thing that we try in the stroke world to really identify for people is not so much what are the risk factors, but what are your personal risk factors? Which of these categories fit to you? And what plan can you take to try to modify some of those? So if you're not someone who's physically active, the weather is getting better, to go out and walk. Right, it doesn't have Get to be a... No, it's not a gym to, membership. Right, a gym membership with uh, rippling abs. You don't have to aspire to no, that. No, 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 no. If you're someone who's always been worried about their blood pressure, go get it checked. Have it monitored, have it looked at, and if you end up on medication, then make sure you follow through with that medication decreasing salt in your diet. Little things like that that could truly reduce your risk factors for stroke. Now there are other risk factors for stroke that, uh, let's take a big one, atrial fibrillation. That we can't change. <laughs> that we can't change, but we can certainly modify the risk. Yeah. Uh, atrial fibrillation for folks at home is a, is a pretty common rhythm abnormality of the heart where the signal, the sinus node, which normally goes like this, uh, is that signaling for the heart to beat is lost and you get sort of a disorganized signaling and it makes your atrium, which are the chambers, are sort of wiggle rather than pump in a nice right. way. And one of the bad things about blood is when it's not moving, it tends to clot. So in parts of the atrium, if, you're going, if your atrium is going like this, people describe it as a bag of worms, which I thought was very descriptive. Oh, <laughs> that is, okay. But, but the atrium's going like this, uh, parts of that, the blood is, may not flow out of that and can clot. Right. So uh, we, there's been a lot of... A lot of treatment. A lot of treatments now. Maybe you can say a few words because I think some of the new treatments are just spectacular. So there's Expensive things, but spectacular. Yes, so there's things that we can definitely do. A lot of times, a lot of patients don't even know that they had AFib until they come in with stroke signs. So some of the things that we do now, instead of just monitoring you while you're in the hospital to see if that rhythm comes back, They'll actually send you home on a 30-day event monitor, and it actually goes underneath the skin, and it's Bluetooth, and it sends over your rhythms to let people know, your cardiologists know, do you have this arrhythmia? You know, I'll also put in a plug, because I was really skeptical about what we had an electrophysiologist, a cardiologist, <laughs> who specializes in rhythm disorders on the show, and she told me that even those, one, those cardiac monitors that you could buy for your iPhone for yes. 80 or 90 bucks, they work. 
they, you can get a nice picture of atrial fibrillation uh, from that. And I would tell you, I was a skeptic myself, but a family friend ended up having a fib, and she goes, oh, I'll show you my heart right here. And she put out her phone, put up the app, and I was like, wow. So if you, and by it's the way, you, you may feel intermittent palpitations. That may be your sign of atrial fib. This allows you to, to record in a way your physician can interpret whether or not you have AFib. And this is because, again, it's, it's important. What do we do when we know somebody has AFib? We control the heart rate, and we try to control the heart rhythm, and that's through your cardiologist, depending upon what they determine. But we do know that having AFib actually puts you at a higher risk of stroke, and it's why it's so important to follow up to make sure we keep that controlled. And many of those patients, excuse me for my earpiece, many of my, those patients do really well on uh, an, uh, blood thinning medicine, mm -hmm. anti anticoagulants. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the lovely things now, again, they're expensive, but some of these new anticoagulants work superbly well in that situation. Uh, they have a lower risk of bleeding. They probably work better to prevent stroke. Yep. Uh, and, and they don't need to be monitored no. the way uh, Coumadin used to be. No, so I know people still use Coumadin, and that's fine, but there's uh, at least three or four, at least three new drugs. They're not that new anymore, but they're very, very useful for atrial fib. And we have, and that's where stroke has come a long way, because between technology and advances in medication, we've actually made it to where it was a very disabil debilitating disease to have a stroke. Granted, there were different severities of the stroke, but now with technology, with advances in medications, we actually have the ability to change and, and just, decrease. And we just have a, a short time left, and I know we're gonna talk about treatment another time, but maybe you could say something about time as brain. That, that, that t in the old it days, is. again, it didn't matter when you saw the doc, when you started your stroke symptoms because we didn't do anything other than make sure you didn't get a complication later. Today, we, we intervene in many instances. Do you want yes. to say a couple of words about how important it is to go in and be checked? So for all of our treatments, which we are gonna discuss, it, it really lies on the time that you were last known well. So all of our treatments are based on time sensitivity. So what happens is a lot of people will come to us in the emergency room and they say, well, I noticed last night at that point, it's almost too late. So once you notice any sign or symptom of a stroke, meaning what we use is the acronym of BFAST. So it's balance to turn on your stability. Eyes, do you have any loss of vision? Face, is it symmetrical on your smile? Can you see the same number of teeth? Arm weakness in either extremity. Is your speech clear? Is it slurred? Are the words correct? And then time is brain. The soonest time that you notice those, it is a 911 call. And it's a 911 call to get you to an emergency room to be evaluated. We rather evaluate 50 people who don't have a stroke than miss the one that did, because then my interventions are limited. And the whole goal is going to be able to s try to save some of that brain tissue so you minimize the long term effect of those strokes. Totally save stroke. brain tissue. And we've had 100% reversible patients. It's, it's, and it's we're going to talk about the amazing progress that's been made, and it's really important for you to know at home that we can treat most, many strokes. Please Unfortunately, help. we are out of time for now. I want to really thank my guest, Michelle Ocardo, for joining me on Health Talk today uh, in order to educate the public on stroke prevention. If you have comments or questions for us, please email us at healthtalk at newvancehealth.org. Thanks so much for watching. Our fight against coronavirus isn't over. We still have to slow the spread and do our part. Let's wear face masks in public. Stay six feet or more from others. Follow state and local guidelines. Wash our hands frequently and stay home when we feel safe. For ourselves, for our loved ones, for our future. Let's move forward together. Learn more at coronavirus.gov. 145 over 92. 180 over 111. 182 over 100. And I had a heart attack and a cardiac arrest and then a stroke. Your blood pressure numbers could change your life. A lot of people don't understand, including myself, I didn't, now I do, uh, the impact of having a stroke. My memory is shot. When I woke up, I couldn't speak. If I would have followed a treatment plan, I would not be in this situation. It's a tough journey.
Lowering your high blood pressure could save you from a heart attack or stroke. If you've stopped your treatment plan, restart it or talk to your doctor about creating one that works better for you. Start taking the right steps at manageyourbp.org. It's a new life, but I'm going to make it better. I'm coming back. Ask your doctor. Check your blood pressure. There are different treatments for stroke depending upon how quickly you get to the hospital and on the specific diagnosis. Today's guest on Health Club, Michelle Licardo, she's a stroke program coordinator with Norwalk Hospital. Michelle will focus on the diagnosis and treatment for stroke while emphasizing the importance of early detection. Time is brave. Hello, I'm Dr. Eric Mazur. Today's Health Talk topic is the diagnosis and treatment of stroke. Our guest is Michelle Licardo. She's the Stroke Program Coordinator at Norwalk Hospital. Welcome to Health Talk, Michelle. Thank you. This is such an important topic. It's also an area which has evolved tremendously in the past 20 years, and it continues to evolve. Absolutely. Uh, the old days, for, uh, we were discussing before, the old days of stroke, someone would come into the hospital, we'd put an IV in their arm, and we would basically do maybe manage their blood pressure a little bit, but otherwise not do a lot and just wait for the stroke to go through its mm -hmm. course. That's not the case today, is it? Not at all. Not tell, at all. Tell us, why, tell us why it's different. Tell us what is a stroke, maybe tell a little bit about the ischemic area, yeah. and, and why management makes such a difference today. So there are two types of stroke. The one that we really discuss the most about and you hear most about is when we call it an acute ischemic stroke meaning that there is a blood clot or plaque in the cerebral artery of the brain. So something has been clogged. The other one that we that don't... That means that a part of the brain is, is not, not getting, getting blood flow. Yep. The other type of stroke that we don't really talk about a lot is a hemorrhagic stroke. And that's when one of the blood vessels of the brain has ruptured. So for today's purposes, we're going to be talking about management and treatment of an acute ischemic stroke and how to restore blood and flow And that's the quickly. majority of strokes. That 80, is the majority. 80% or something 80 like that. 80% of strokes are uh, the blood clot versus the bleeding on the brain. So when we talk about an acute ischemic stroke, what actually has happened is there's a, been a blood clot that now I don't have blood in supply to my brain. The treatment for that, it always was what we call a thrombolytic therapy. It was a drug, a medication, that actually would go in and break up the clot to restore blood flow. And so, people may have heard of that as the clot busting medicine. Yes, <laughs> when uh, they first came out, it was the clot buster. So go, go and ahead. And now, um, we not only have that medication, we've actually extended its use, and we've created out to, believe it or not, a window of eight hours. Our golden hour for you to get to the hospital is still as soon as possible. The sooner you arrive after your symptom onset, the more treatment options that are available to you. Maybe you could explain that a little bit from the standpoint, you've got a clot that is reducing or eliminating blood flow to part of the brain. Why does it matter how quickly you, you get, get to the hospital? So as that clot and there's no blood flow or sugar, glucose getting to the brain, the brain is being starved of oxygen and nutrients. So the quicker that we restore flow, the more of that tissue we'll be able to save. Once that tissue dies, we cannot get it back. And I think that's the point. When you have a, a blocked artery, sort of in the center of that area, the tissue may die quickly. Yes. And then it, it, it gets larger and larger as that blood flow continues to be blocked off. So if it's going to happen like this yep. over time. So you want to get in there and restore blood flow when the amount of permanent damage is as little or none as at possible. All. And that's exactly it. So I think people, um, we always had this impression that once you had a blood clot and that tissue was there, then okay, we couldn't do anything. Right, and that's what we now understand isn't true. Over time, we have learned that there's a lot of interventions that we can do. And truly the goal is to minimize the disability of the stroke so that it is no longer a disabling disease and again we do that with the medication and then we also have interventions now where we actually go through the groin up into the brain up into the artery we grab that clot and pull that clot back out 
to restore blood flow to your brain. Yeah, but, but that sounds really simple, but it really oh, no. is not. No. <laughs> Not at all. <laughs> That's not like it. I mean, if you think about that, you've got a a, a neuroradiologist or whomever does this. Neurosurgeons. Threading a catheter up through your aorta, which is the big artery, yep. up through your, your carotid, carotids, into a small artery in your head. Yep. And is pulling out the clot or giving yes. clot busting bugs through it or Either both? way. Either way. The majority of the time they're taking the clot out. Sometimes some will choose to inject a little bit of that clot buster drug right to the clot and then pull it out. And a lot of times now, we're also leaving coil uh, stents up in the cerebral Almost circulation. Almost like we used to do in the heart, or didn't used to do, but Still do. putting stents in the heart, we're now putting them in the brain. Mm -hmm. That's really amazing that the technology that has allowed us to do this. Can you have any examples of I think sometimes the recoveries can be rather profound and dramatic. Can you give some dramatic. examples of what you've seen? So we have had very young patients, and when I say young, I'm talking anywhere from 30s to 50 range because that is considered young for a stroke. I consider that young under any circumstances. <laughs> um, and truly, they got to the hospital in a matter of an hour to two hours from their symptoms, and we were actually able to go up and pull out the clot and they made full recoveries. 100% walking and talking and leaving the hospital. These are people that may not have been able to talk, may not have been able to move half, half of nope. their body. When you come into the hospital for that type of procedure, your stroke is considered severe. It truly will be a detrimental stroke, leaving you with major disability if we cannot do the, if we do not go and get the clot. So those, that technique, when we talked about, well, what type of treatment, that technique is only available to those with severe stroke upon presentation. Mm -hmm. If your stroke isn't as severe, and we have a score, we have a table that we base it off of based on what you come in with, then we will give you the clot busting drug. Mm -hmm. If you get to the hospital in time fashion and you have a severe stroke, we will do both. So really the patients that do the best and have the best outcomes are the ones that get here the quickest that are eligible for the medication as well as the mechanical thrombectomy. And those patients nearly have 100% recovery. Not all, but we actually give them a chance to where before you never had a chance. It's really striking the difference. Mm -hmm. Michelle, I mean, obviously this takes a lot of coordination among the doctors. Uh, maybe you can say a little bit what, what's happening in the background. The patients, again, I, I don't think we can emphasize strongly enough that if you're having a symptom, get to the hospital. If you're not sure that's okay, you're not yeah. gonna be embarrassed, uh, get to the hospital as soon as you can. 24 hours later is not soon enough. Mm -mm. Uh, no, it really is a systems of care. You know, as we continue to move forward, we really try to work in systems of care. So no matter where you are, if you're having any signs or symptoms of a stroke, you're having blurred vision, you're having dizziness, you have a headache that's uncontrolled, you have speech that doesn't sound right, you just don't feel right, your arm becomes weak. You need to immediately from that spot call 911, whether you're at the store, whether you're at home, whether you're at work. So this is not it doesn't get in your matter. car or call your Uncle Max Absolutely to drive you to the not. hospital. No. This, this is a, a medical 9 emergency. 911 call. And the rationale behind that truly is EMS will then give the hospital a heads up and give the hospital time to prepare for your arrival. And that's what I wanted you to get into, is that this triggers a whole downstream reaction yes. down in the hospital. So tell us a little bit about that. We, we, are we waiting. call it a stroke alert. Yes, and we are waiting for you in the emergency room. We're waiting for your arrival. We literally have a team that pulls to wait for you to get there. And this is 24 hours a day, 24 seven hours, seven days a week. And it takes EMS, it goes into account to the emergency physicians, and it goes into account to the emergency nurses. At that point in the emergency room, a lot of prep is going on, and we are getting you to CAT scan within minutes of your arrival. Radiology has done a phenomenal job in supporting this. Depending upon your score, we're running you through your test, we're getting you back to the emergency room, and hopefully you came in in enough time that we can give you adequate treatment, which is either gonna be that blood, clot, blood, blood clot busting drug, say that five times, or the mechanical thrombectomy. And you mentioned that here in Norwalk, we actually have uh, 
neuro hospital based yep. neurologist yep. To, for this as well as other reasons. Yes, we do. So there's somebody here all the time. Yes. To, Yep, to we respond. have a neurologist available 24-7 to us. And the other, I guess, point to make is the, uh, the neurosurgeon who would mm -hmm. do this procedure, there's somebody, he may not be, he or she, may not be sitting in the emergency department, but they are on call and need to be able to get here within 15 or 20 minutes. So yeah. that they're, they're, they'll be there when you get out of the CAT scan if Absolutely. you're Absolutely. Currently within our system, um, we have two that are on this side of New Vance covering um, Norwalk, Danbury, and New Milford. And truly, they are looking at those films at any time that we have, and they're reviewing whether or not you are eligible. And our whole goal is, if you are eligible, is to get you from our emergency room door into the suite, catheterization suite, within 90 minutes to have you revascularize. That's how important it is. And Michelle, maybe I know the clock actually does run. It you runs. You, this is monitored, this it, is reported to the yes. regulatory agencies. Yes. Uh, are stroke, are this time stroke treatment available everywhere or most places now? So the majority of places, yes. Um, there's more and more thrombectomy centers, which is what we call that clot busting, pulling out, um, becoming more and more available. It is in the standards of care as a standard for treatment. So yes, it is becoming much more available than what it ever was before, um, but not every community hospital provides that type of treatment. They will send you out to the closest facility, but again, that takes more time and I'm losing more brain cells. Right, so some places they may just give you the clot busting blood yep. by, by vein if they don't have access to a mm -hmm. neurosurgeon who can do these thrombectomies. Mm -hmm. Uh, how long has this been available? So here at Norwalk, we've been doing this procedure for almost five years, um, and, and we've had great success with it. Um, as far as the clot busting drug, that's been available now for 20 years, but we've actually seen a significant increase, or I should say decrease, in stroke residuals in patients doing so uh, much and better. Now I'm going to show my age. Uh, <laughs> back when I was actively practicing, uh, Despite the, all of this information, uh, the number of people eligible for clot busting drugs tended to be very few. I don't remember five or 10 percent yeah. because people did come in too late or their stroke wasn't the right place or size. And then w there was a great deal of problems with or risk, maybe one percent, of bleeding into the mm -hmm. brain. Uh, has that changed? Has so, that changed? Are more people eligible now with these wider time frames? And uh, have we have we been able to prove some improve some of the risks of treatment? Yeah. So through research and American Heart Association and American Stroke Association, we've really opened up that umbrella of who can get the medication. We actually give the drug now, like I was um, had said before, we we have a small population of patients that we can give this medication to out to eight hours if you fit that category. The standard population is out to four and a half hours. And it used to be something like 90 minutes. It was, yes, it was very, very short. It was three hours, we went to four and a half, and now we're out almost to eight. And some of these thrombectomy procedures. We can do up to 24 hours. Which is really amazing. So, but again, I, uh, the only thing that I can urge the people, and the only thing that I would really like them to take home is if you have symptoms, get to the hospital as soon as possible because that is your best option for a full recovery. And we can't emphasize that enough. Yes. Okay, 911. Right. And unfortunately, we have run out of time. I want to thank my guest, Michelle Licardo, for joining us on Health Talk today and thank you for watching. Don't forget that time is brain. If you have comments or questions you'd like to ask us, please email us at healthbook at newvancehealth.org. Please stay well. One forty five over ninety two. One eighty over one eleven. One hundred and eighty two over a hundred. And I had a heart attack and a cardiac arrest and then a stroke. Your blood pressure numbers could change your life. A lot of people don't understand, including myself, I didn't, now I do, uh, the impact of having a stroke. My memory is shot. When I woke up, I couldn't speak. If I would have followed a treatment plan, I would not be in this situation. It's a tough journey. 
Lowering your high blood pressure could save you from a heart attack or stroke. If you've stopped your treatment plan, restart it, or talk to your doctor about creating one that works better for you. Start taking the right steps.